This case takes place in Australia and spans over a number of years. On the 27th of June, 1951, Leonard John Fraser was born. He was raised in a quiet town called Ingham, nestled away in North Queensland. Leonard was the fourth of five other siblings within a seemingly typical family structure. His mother assumed the role of a stay-at-home housewife, while his father, a veteran of World War II, pursued a career as a machinist, often spending prolonged periods of time away from home due to work commitments. Despite the facade of a post-World War II dream, the family was plagued by a significant and harrowing event. This set the wheels in motion for the creation of one of Australia's most chilling and disturbing serial killers. In 1952, Leonard's older brother was taking a ride on a piece of heavy machinery called a grader. This particular machine is used to flatten surfaces. As the machine bounced and rattled, his poor brother fell from the machine and unfortunately landed in front of the rear tyre. By the time the vehicle was stopped, it was already too late. A grief-stricken environment is a tough place to grow up. Leonard quickly became an aggressive child, full of rage, hard to please, and prone to tantrums. This was not helped by the turbulence that came from moving around throughout his youth for his father's work, always having to start fresh at new schools, and being afflicted with a speech impediment meant he struggled with forming friendships and long-lasting bonds. Not only that, but the disruption to his schooling may be the reason why the educational authorities branded him as having a low IQ. Throughout his youth, he was known to steal from time to time, putting his knowledge of machine and mechanics to practice. By the time he was 15, he would steal parts from cars. And at the same time, his aggression was on the rise, often taking illegal substances, fighting, and even threatening women, saying that he would force himself upon them. These crimes eventually landed him in Gosford Boys' home, in an attempt by law enforcement to nip his criminality in the bud, teaching him how to be a good lad the harder way. There, he served two sentences across one year. Like many youth correctional facilities, they became congregations of early criminals, giving them all the ability to network and to learn new abhorrent tricks and crimes. It was a terrible position to be in as an impressionable and tainted teenager, a true dog-eat-dog -dog environment. This would be the place where Leonard would learn to take what he wanted whenever he wanted. Leonard was the victim of older inmates asserting themselves on him, so he did the same to younger inmates. He forced himself upon them, just like the older ones had done to him. To this day, it is not known how many occasions he was a victim or a perpetrator of SA while he was in Gosford. After one year, Leonard was released, more aggressive and more dangerous than ever. His mother would later say that she felt like he had a split personality. One moment, he was nice, and the next he would be vicious. As his crimes continued to escalate in severity, by 1968, when Leonard was 17, he brutally assaulted a railway guard, landing himself on probation until 1970. In February of 1971, Leonard was jailed for six months for Grand Theft Auto. After being released, he stole another car and drove to Townsville. He was caught and served another nine months in prison. By 1972, at the age of 21, Leonard was adopted by all that was criminal, and he moved to King's Cross, Sydney. King's Cross at the time was infamous for criminality. It was here where he worked as a pimp and spent large proportions of his income on alcohol and illegal substances, fueling his hobby of street fighting. Later that year, on the 17th of October, Leonard got into an altercation with his roommate, which resulted in him storming off. Whilst in his fit of rage, he found himself in the Botanical Garden in Sydney. Perhaps this was an intentional decision to calm down in the serenity of nature. However, knowing what was about to happen, I think not. It seems that Leonard was looking to take his anger out on whoever was unfortunate enough to approach him. A 37-year-old French tourist and mother of two innocently approached Leonard for directions. In a chilling and utterly sinister manoeuvre, 
Leonard deliberately directed her down a path he knew wouldn't lead her to her intended destination. He then proceeded to follow her. He grabbed this woman from behind, beat her black and blue, and then dragged her behind a tree, where he proceeded to force himself upon her. He did this in such a brutal way that the poor victim would never be able to conceive children again. The lady did manage to muster enough strength to spring free of Leonard, and she managed to run away. Not long after, Leonard was sentenced to five years in prison for crimes completely unrelated to the essay at the Botanical Gardens. Instead, he was charged with a series of attacks, but only spent a fraction of the sentence in prison after being released at the age of 23 in 1974. In keeping with his ever-escalating crimes, within the first three weeks of his release, Leonard Frazier essayed three separate women. One lady was stalked by Leonard before he dragged her out of sight towards an embankment, and there he forced himself upon her. What makes this even more disturbing is how after the incident, he made her walk with him from the scene of the crime holding hands under the threat of further assaults. Leonard then fled. Next, in July of 1974, he stalked another woman near the Great Western Shopping Centre in Mount Druitt. She was alone, innocently picking up her dry-cleaned clothing. Like a true predator, Leonard devised a plan to pretend to collect his dry-cleaning following her into the back room, where he tried to restrain her, bending her arms behind her and forcing her to the floor. Luckily, this attack did not end with Leonard getting what he wanted, as the woman managed to set herself free and escape. Furious and unsatisfied, three days later, Leonard went on the hunt for his next victim and proceeded with a more direct approach. This time, he walked up to the woman and within seconds, he savagely punched her in the face and attempted to assert himself on her. This time, as he was removing his clothing, the woman managed to persuade him that instead of going through with this act, they should both go back to her house and have consensual sex. As I mentioned earlier, Leonard had a low IQ. Luckily, he fell for this deception, and the woman managed to escape, alerting her neighbouring houses. In a fit of panic, Leonard scrambled for his belongings, but as he ran away, he dropped his wallet, containing no less than his birth certificate and documentation containing his name and address. As you might expect, he was taken into police custody and questioned. The police suspected Leonard of a series of essays, to which he confessed. During this confession, he included the French tourist he attacked in Sydney, and despite his best efforts to represent himself in court, he was given a 21-year prison sentence. Whilst in prison, he was diagnosed with classical psychopathy, of which there is no known treatment, and one would determine that such a man would continue to be a threat to society if he would ever be released. But as some of you already might know from my previous videos, the Australian legal system is rather lenient. Despite earning the nickname of Lenny the Loon in prison, he was released at the age of 30 in 1981, having served seven years of his 21-year prison sentence. There are many who still question this gross negligence, and rightly so. It points blame towards the correctional system. It was noted by guards that he was still a threat, yet he was still allowed to be released. After his release, Leonard moved to Hare Point in Queensland. This was where his parents lived, and he started to work a steady job as a labourer, with little evidence of any law-breaking. That was until he regained a taste for it. Leonard noticed a woman trying to sell her car, so he approached her, and the encounter took a terrible turn. Leonard attacked the woman whilst in her own house, with her husband sitting in another room. Despite his appalling record, Leonard managed to avoid being locked up for a long time and was only sentenced to two months in jail for aggravated assault. In 1982, when Leonard was 31, he struck up a relationship with Pearl Rigby, a 26-year-old single mother with a son, offering him a semblance of stability amidst his chaotic life. At the time, Leonard worked as a foreman at Queensland Rail, where his reputation for partying earned him the nickname Animal. 
Although known for his rowdy behaviour, Leonard's interactions with Pearl were notably turned down, especially when compared to his previous interactions with women, with reports suggesting only one instance of physical confrontation where he slapped her in the face. This marked a significant shift for Leonard, who, for the first time, found steady employment and settled into a domestic life, a stark contrast to his previous nomadic lifestyle littered by spells of incarceration. But the inner predator returned. In 1985, when he was 34 years old, Leonard reverted to stalking women, targeting one at Shoal Beach north of Mackay. He employed tactics that he learned from Gosforth Boys Home. He made advances on the woman, taking what he wanted as he wanted it, disregarding her protests. In an attempt to defend herself, the woman suggested they continue at her house under the guise of consent. Leonard, having previously been duped by the same tactic, didn't believe her, and then he continued the attack, forcing himself on her. Even though Leonard went to his friend's house straight after the attack, looking for some kind of alibi, it wasn't long before law enforcement arrived at Leonard's house. Pearl would soon learn the horrific truth about Leonard's history, and he was arrested and locked up again. This time, Leonard was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment at the Rockhamptons Creek Prison, and he served every second of that sentence. In January of 1997, when he was 46 years old, Leonard was released, and he started living with a woman named Marie Shivers. The two had communicated as pen pals during his sentence. Marie believed that Leonard was a good man, and that he was just being screwed by the system, just as Leonard wanted. During their time living together, Leonard became abusive, so much so that Marie's mother Vera once found bruises all up her arm. So she confronted Leonard whilst in the public outside of a Woolworths shop, only for Leonard to respond with more violence, threatening in public that he would slice their throats. Marie became very ill, diagnosed with terminal cancer, and she required treatment in Brisbane. Marie told Leonard that this time it was unlikely that she would be coming back. Leonard tried his best to see her one last time. He hitchhiked from Rockhampton to Brisbane, but this wasn't an act of compassion. On arrival, Leonard escorted her to the hospital chapel, locked the door, and violently assaulted her in ways too heinous to imagine. He left Marie lying on the floor. Marie, in her dying days, courageously told her story to her mother about the assault. Two weeks later, she passed away. Leonard next moved to Mount Morgan, where he quickly came to the attention of law enforcement. They kept an eye on him, but this never prevented countless essays upon 16 women. He would befriend them and sometimes have consensual relationships before they turned abusive. Many of the locals were suspicious, but they were silenced by Leonard under the threat that if they ever went to the police, a motorcycle gang would come to town and deal with them. By 1998, with no formal complaints registered with the police, Leonard was run out of the town back to Rockhampton, where things began to severely escalate. In 1998, at the age of 47, Leonard started a relationship with a 19-year-old cognitively disabled lady called Chrissy. As a result of her disability, Chrissy was particularly vulnerable and fell prey to Leonard's wickedness. Their relationship became inevitably very controlling. A chilling precursor for what was to happen next, Leonard, in a fit of rage, decided to kill Chris's two kittens. Not only this, he was caught forcing himself upon her female dog. When Chrissy confronted him about these acts of cruelty, she kicked him out of her house. However, one week later, Leonard took his revenge. He murdered her dog by poisoning her food bowl. Unfortunately, in spite of killing her pets, Chrissy stayed with Leonard, all while he was out stalking and assaulting other women with disabilities, and during this time, he started to murder. On the 7th of December 1998, Julie Don Turner went to a pub for some drinks, although she arrived heavily intoxicated. 
The bouncer realised what state she was in, and he arranged a cab for her to take her home safely. But Julie never made it back. Julie herself was in a troubled relationship at home with her partner. She worked with Leonard, and whilst they were at work, she would confide in him about her troubles. Leonard presented himself as caring and charming. When Julie left the pub that one fateful night, little did she know that she was being stalked by Leonard Frazier, her supposed friend. As Julie walked home, Leonard attacked her, punching her in the back of the head while she rolled a cigarette. He then brutally assaulted her, breaking her neck and strangling her. Once he was sure she was dead, he proceeded to violate her body. He then disposed of incriminating evidence, including his bloody shirt and Julie's clothing, before returning to his girlfriend Chrissy with Julie's body in the boot of his car. Whilst Chrissy was sleeping, Leonard took a shower, changed his clothes, and asked Chrissy if she wanted to go out for a drive, accompanying him whilst he disposed of Julie's body. Chrissy declined, unaware of Leonard's ulterior motives, and she passed on driving to Kinka Beach, where he pulled up at a spot, took her body out of the car, and carried her down a dense track into the bushland, and hid her body under sticks and leaves. Now, if this wasn't disturbing enough, Leonard wasn't finished. He returned several times in the following weeks, asserting himself on the corpse. Eventually, he would cut her head off, and what exactly he did with her head isn't known. However, within the next two years, her body was found. Three months later, on March the 1st, 1999, Leonard struck again. This time a woman who would go on to be listed as missing for years before the evidence of her tragic end was realised. Beverly Lego was a 36-year-old woman who was deeply burdened by a tragic and traumatic past. Beverly was once duped into a modelling career, only to be hooked on illegal substances, trafficked and forced to sell her body. When she escaped her past and returned to her home, it left her with schizophrenia and made her a very vulnerable person. As a result, she was taken advantage of and ended up in a terrible relationship. Leonard had prior knowledge of Beverly, as her partner had served alongside him in jail. Strangely enough, they had even resided in Mount Morgan around the same period as Leonard. One day, Leonard offered Beverly a friendly ride home from shopping, but an argument erupted in the car as she rejected his advances, leading to Leonard violently attacking her afterward. Leonard killed Beverly, and again, not knowing what to do with her body, he callously disposed of her in the bushland, violating her corpse before he left the crime scene. Soon after this murder, Leonard would strike again. On the 18th of April 1999, the tragic fate of 19-year-old Sylvia Marie unfolded at the hands of Leonard. Drawn in by the allure of illegal substances and the promise of shelter, Sylvia encountered Leonard through a mutual acquaintance at a local Centrelink. Sylvia was a remarkable artist who had an obsession with the macabre. She would often incorporate paint blood spatters into her work, and she used to repeat a premonition to all of those whom she met. This premonition was that she would not live past the age of 21, and would meet her end in a brutal attack. Tragically, little did she know her premonitions were to become a reality. At this time, Leonard occasionally squatted in a desolate, boarded-up hotel in Rockhampton, meters from a local police station. He met with Sylvia and ushered her into room 13 under the guise of sharing in the use of recreational illegal substances. Leonard lent in for a kiss, but Sylvia rejected his advancement. This was met with violence to the highest degree. Leonard shattered Sylvia's skull, ejecting bone fragments and teeth, causing blood spatters to spray up the derelict hotel room wall and ceiling, leaving her defenseless against further brutality. After killing Sylvia, he yet again violated her body. Leonard then wrapped her head up in a towel, carrying her downstairs into the gents' toilets, dripping blood as he went. Once in the hotel's derelict bathroom, he placed the body of Sylvia over a drain. 
After the horrifying events, Sylvia's blood made it into his car, and later evidence of her DNA was found on the rear passenger seat, armrest, driver's seat, and on cigarette papers in his glove box, indicating that Leonard likely had a post-murder cigarette. He left her there, draining her body of blood via her skull for three days, only going back to the scene of the crime once he found out that the building was scheduled to be demolished. He retrieved the body and buried her at Sandy Point in a shallow grave. She wouldn't be found for another 18 months. Undoubtedly to this day, the scale of his murdering spree is not fully known. These cases were only uncovered after a large-scale investigation and after information was leaked by a cellmate. However, this would only happen when he was caught and found guilty of the next and final murder. You may believe that this case can't get any worse, but unfortunately, it does. On the 22nd of April 1999, Leonard set his eyes on Kira Steinhardt, who was nine. She had just started walking home from school by herself without her parents and was on her 10th day of doing so. She really wanted to join her peers and cycle home, but her stepfather would never allow this, as he thought it was too unsafe to ride in traffic. Kira was brought up well. She was well educated and knew never to talk to strangers under any circumstances. And, in an attempt to stay safe, she would walk a long while with her friends before cutting through a vacant allotment near Rockhampton High School, reducing her walk to no more than 30 minutes. Little did she know that a man around the age of 45 was following her, for a second day in a row. On the first day, it is theorised that Leonard was working out the exact path she took home, possibly a tactic deployed often for many of his stalked victims or near victims. This time, at around 3.30pm, as Kira was crossing the allotment, Leonard closed in behind her, and with a single blow, he bludgeoned the back of her head with his fists, and she fell to the ground in an area of tall grass. Leonard stood and looked over her unconscious body. He went to the ground and proceeded to force himself on her, for a period of 20 minutes. Leonard, not knowing what to do with the body, took off his shirt, wrapped her body up in it, and placed her in the boot of his red sedan car. In the coming days, the Australian authorities sprung a huge search and rescue mission to find the fate of Kira. The details of the tragic event that unfolded on the vacant allotment are only known due to an eyewitness account that observed the whole thing. They came forward to the police and provided an anonymous tip. The eyewitnesses were an elderly couple sitting on their porch overlooking the allotments. The woman was claiming that she saw a man, the same man as the day before, stalking a girl with blonde hair. The male eyewitness dismissed this, saying it was her father and that there was nothing to worry about. Once the male eyewitness went inside for a beverage, the woman noticed Leonard hitting young Kira on the back of the head and claimed both Leonard and Kira were on the ground for 20 minutes. Why didn't they shout or make themselves known? The couple did not alert the authorities for at least 20 minutes, a delay which outraged the community. Following the savage attack on Kira, Leonard proceeded with his routine, devoid of any remorse. After returning home and cleansing himself of the bloodshed, he collected his unsuspecting girlfriend, Chrissy. Unknown to her, Kira's lifeless body lay concealed in the trunk of his vehicle. Once they both arrived at the designated location to dispose of Kira's remains, Leonard instructed Chrissy to look away. Chrissy later told the authorities that her initial belief was that the object in question was nothing more than a doll, blissfully unaware of the horror that lay before her. The disappearance of Kira was broadcast far and wide, and it wouldn't take long for Leonard to be caught. A man who worked for a prison just so happened to be near the school picking up his daughter when he saw Leonard lurking around the school on the day that Kira went missing. He noticed that Leonard was even wearing the same clothing identified by the eyewitness account. This man realised that Leonard was likely responsible for the disappearance, so he informed the authorities and told them that he believed he knew who had taken Kira. 
Detectives rushed to the premises of Leonard Frazier and also identified his red sedan. When confronted, he claimed he had no idea what the police were talking about. Not convinced, the police unit apprehended him and took him to the police station along with his girlfriend Chrissy. A thorough search of his house unveiled a horrific trove of collectibles, assuming from his previous victims. This consisted of books, bags, diaries, jewellery, vacuum cleaners full of dirt, and even a bag filled with children's ponytails, some of which were saturated with lice. This, along with bloodstains throughout his red sedan, was not enough to force a confession out of Leonard, or a location where he may be keeping her. This was enough to prosecute him with the abduction of Kara, but not enough for murder. Leonard was questioned further, but he claimed he had a foggy recollection of the event, and he couldn't recall what he did or where he put her. It wouldn't be until 13 days later that Leonard finally told law enforcement where her body was. This may seem like an arbitrary number of days to pass, however, despite Leonard's low IQ, he knew this was no random period. It is theorised that he left it nearly two weeks so that any DNA remnants of his essay would be destroyed. Leonard had left Kara near a tree covered with grass, with what appeared to be a cut across the neck. In September of the year 2000, the Brisbane Supreme Court found Leonard John Fraser guilty of abducting and killing Kara. The judge described him as a predator of the worst kind sentencing him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Luckily, Leonard placed his trust in a fellow inmate who would become an informant and managed to extract a map from Leonard, with many of his victims labelled. It also does need to be mentioned that it is not 100% confirmed that Leonard defiled the bodies of the victims after their deaths. There was not enough substantial evidence to convict him of this crime, however, there was a large amount of circumstantial evidence, leading to many working on the case and many experts to conclude that he did do this. This relationship with the informant led to the discovery of many victims and the uncovering of their final moments. This included Julie Don Turner, Beverly Lego, and Sylvia Marie. There was also another suspected victim, Leonard had been suspected and charged of the disappearance of a woman by the name of Natasha Ryan. Leonard claimed to have forced himself on and killed her, and she had been missing for some time. But during the trial, she was found at her boyfriend's home years after her disappearance. She had been in hiding. This caused some issues with the court proceedings, and even almost ruined the entire trial. Thankfully, however, the trial would go ahead. Leonard was found guilty of these murders, and he was given three indefinite jail terms. The judge who was involved described him as an untreatable psychopath. At 4am on the morning of New Year's Day 2007, Leonard John Fraser passed away from a cardiac arrest. Many people who knew of Leonard were happy that another murderous psychopath left this earth never to hurt another innocent person again. The same cannot be said for many of his victims' families, as the news that he didn't suffer in prison for longer gave them little comfort.